we just thank you this morning for an opportunity to get together and study your word. Lord, I pray that as we spend time together, Lord, that you would just speak to our hearts, you would challenge our minds, that we as a church would be about the business you call us to be about. Help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So some of you, most of you know Jennifer and I, we just got back from vacation. Uh, every year about this time, we, we try to go uh, to some Caribbean island for an all-inclusive resort. And, uh, you know, the last thing we want to do is be bothered uh, when we get there with a wake-up call. I mean, we're on vacation. We're there to relax. We don't want to be bothered. Uh, unfortunately, my brain is hardwired, and I'm always awake by about 5, 5.30. Um, so I have to sneak off into the other room and have my quiet time and have my coffee and serve Jennifer coffee in bed. It's kind of become a regular routine, but the, like I said, the last thing we want to be is bothered by the front desk with a wake-up call. But you know, I've been thinking a lot about that lately, and I wonder if sometimes we as a church act the same way. Not now, God. I'm on vacation. Don't bother me. This morning we conclude our, our study of Mark 13. And in doing so, I believe that Jesus' words are providing us, his church, with a wake-up call. Most of you are probably aware today is Palm Sunday, a day in which we typically remember and celebrate Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. That's something we covered back when we looked at Mark 11. After his arrival in Jerusalem, we, we learned of Jesus. He went into the temple. Uh, he cleaned it out because they were uh, taking advantage of people. He turned over the tables of the money changers. He turned over the chairs of those that were selling pigeons. It was quite a scene. The Jewish leaders, uh, religious leaders, went on to challenge him and his authority. Who, who gave you the authority to do these things? Jesus, he tells a parable, and he basically points out that these religious Leaders are the ones that are guilty of, of rejecting uh, the chief cornerstone. He goes on to answer some of their questions, and he does it in such a way that he silences them. Uh, chapter 12, verse 34 says that after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Then we saw Jesus who was sitting there in the court of women. He was looking across the way at people putting money in the treasury. And he, he calls his, his boys over and, and, and he points out this poor widow who puts two small coins in the offering, giving all that she had out of her poverty, while many rich people put several large sums of money in the, in the offering out of their abundance or their excess. And he tells his disciples that she's put in more money. I mean, really, Jesus? I mean, look at this place. It's a magnificent structure. Who's going to pay for this? Her, her, two, her two coins certainly aren't going to pay for it. In fact, we see that at the beginning of chapter 13. Uh, as they're exiting the temple, uh, one of the disciples points out the magnificent, magnificent structure of the temple. In verse 2, Jesus responds saying that not one stone will be left upon it that will not be torn down. He tells his disciples that the entire complex is going to be destroyed, completely leveled. And the disciples there in verse 4, uh, tell us when will these things be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? We've already begun to look at Jesus' response, verses 5 to 37. Today we're going to close it out by looking at verses 24 to 37. But he begins to answer them. And like I said in the last couple of times we've met together, it's an answer that has caused much debate today. We said this, he didn't necessarily separate out their questions and answer them one by one. He mentions various things that are going to take place before the temple would be destroyed. Some, something that was actually uh, occurred in 8070 when the Roman army encircled the city and brutalized the Jews and destroyed the city. Verse 19, Jesus tells the disciples that in those days there will be a, a tribulation as not seen uh, from the beginning of the creation that God created until now. 
and never will be. Now, there are many today that would, would read that and they'd say, aha, this is, uh, Jesus just must be talking about the great tribulation found in Revelation 1. That's, that's one interpretation. But I think it's important to understand that Jewish uh, historian Josephus, he, he recorded some of the atrocities that were suffered by the Jews unlike they'd ever had before. He, he records that in this, this uh, siege that, that the Roman army put on Jerusalem, uh, there was cannibalism, torture, savagery. And I've said this, the, the Christians, the Jewish Christians, they hated Jesus' warning to flee the city when they, when they saw the Roman army beginning to circle. And I don't know if you know this, but it's reported that one million Jews were killed in Jerusalem at that time. Clearly, this was a period of great tribulation for the Jews. Jesus, he, he's telling his disciples, uh, uh, this would be the worst time in current history. And, and if God doesn't uh, shorten the time, nobody's going to survive. But for the sake of God's chosen people, he, he shortened the days. I, I showed this slide last week, but in context of AD 70, the elect... For whose sake the seeds were shortened are probably the faithful members of the church of Jerusalem, whose intercession or whose presence secured this privilege, though it did not avail to save the city. That's the uh, H.B. Sweet being quoted uh, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary. And I said this last week, the challenge for his disciples, Jesus' disciples in that time was to remain faithful through the events that were about to take place. We've said this, be on guard, be, beware of deception, and, and be at work. The church, the same is true for us today as we await for the return of Christ. Disciples, a wake-up call. Apparently people had, had, had turned their religion or their relationship with God into something other than what God had actually intended. They, they'd lost their focus. I mean, right here at the beginning of the chapter, as they're exiting, uh, one of the disciples, he, he's more focused uh, on the temple. And then Jesus tells him that uh, that temple's going to be destroyed. And, and when the disciples say, well, 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 what are the signs? We want to see the signs. And see, the problem with that is they were focusing on the signs being given, but not on what they were supposed to be doing. Christian, what are you focused on today? You see, I find many uh, read this passage here, they try to determine uh, the signs of Jesus' second coming, placing a, a major emphasis on the signs rather than what Jesus, what Jesus admonishes disciples and the church to do in the text. Last week I pointed out there are four main views on the end of time. Many have become preoccupied with that. Church, it might very well be time for another wake-up call. So follow as I read verses 24 through 27. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken, and they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now I've got a question for you. When you read these four verses, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Is it the sun and moon being darkened? Would it be falling stars? Would it be the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory? Would it, would it be the angels gathering together the elect from the four uh, corners? The church, here's the thing. If the first thing that comes to your mind is anything other than the Son of Man coming in the clouds, it could be that you need a wake-up call. could be this morning that your focus is on the wrong thing. See, unlike his humble first coming, Jesus born in a manger, right? We all know the story. Unlike that, Jesus is coming back for his church, and I believe it's in a very big way. It's a way that I believe everyone's going to notice, even creation itself is going to notice it. 
Heavens will be shaken. Jesus will come in the clouds with great power and glory. We need to focus on that reality this morning. Jesus is coming back. I know there are those that say, well, you know, I joked about it a little bit last week. You know, I don't want to be in an airplane when he comes because, you know, the, the airplane's going to fall out of the sky and, you know, people are going to wake up and... Listen, right there, it, those verses tell us that he's coming back in a big way. It's not going to be some silent rapture. He's going to arrive and the, the clouds, are, uh, the, the powers are, uh, in the heaven will be shaken. This is pretty amazing to me. But wait, Pastor, don't all these other things happen first? I want you to remember right here, Jesus, he's, he's answering their questions about the destruction of the temple. It's likely in their minds uh, that that would have included the, the end of time. And we already learned that the temple was leveled in AD 70. He, he, it's fulfilling what Jesus is prophesying right here in these verses. This was a sign still uh, to those who were still living in that generation to remain faithful. And know that Christ will return again. And by the way, it should be sign enough for us. Think about this, church. He, he's telling his disciples well before the event happens that in AD 70, uh, the temple's going to be destroyed. And guess what it was? That should be sign enough for us that, that Jesus is who he says he is. Pastor, how will the angels gather the elect? Listen, Jesus is going to return at the end. He'll gather together his church, no matter where we are located, no matter whether we are dead or alive. We saw this last week, but let me read it again so you can be encouraged this morning. 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 to 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Church, be encouraged with that truth this morning, regardless of your view on how it ends. Amen. Jesus is giving his disciples a wake-up call. And as we wait for his return, we're to watch, we're to wait, but we're also to work. Look at verses 28 to 31. From the fig tree, learn its lesson. As soon as its branch becomes tender and puts out its leaves, you know the summer is near. So also when you see these things take place, you know that he is near at the very gates. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. Remember, verse 4, Jesus, when's this going to happen? Jesus tells his disciples right here to learn a lesson. Now, this may seem real simple to us, but in that region, fig trees, they, they lose their leaves in the winter, the, they bloom later in the spring, kind of like us, and of course, they're in a different part of the world, but when people saw the stiff, dry twigs of a fig tree becoming tender and producing uh, some leaves, okay, that was a sign that the summer was coming. And Jesus, he's pointing out, when, when you see these things uh, these events, these things happen in verses 14 to 23 that we've covered. When you begin to see these things, understand that the predicted destruction of the temple is near. Then this, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. Sometimes I think we misunderstand that. I believe Jesus is telling his disciples that these, these events in verses 14 to 23, uh, they will have taken place before that generation of Jesus' followers died. Furthermore, these signs would also indicate that Jesus was in fact going to return and his disciples could be sure of that. Like I said, these things should serve as proof to them and to us. Again, all these things that Jesus said, 
there in verses 14 to 23 that we've covered, uh, they were fulfilled by AD 70. That means there were those uh, who were following Jesus who, who still would have been alive when these things happened. Listen, there's a truth today that still remains almost 2,000 years later. And the truth is this, that Jesus could arrive at any moment. It's important to know that truth today. Church, Jesus is coming back and we need to be awake. Are you living in a, a way that indicates that you're awake? Who are you living for this morning, for self or for Christ? Perhaps this morning you need to raise from your selfish slumber. Look at verses 32 to 37. But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake. For do you not know when the master of the house will come in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he come suddenly and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to you all, stay awake. Jesus is coming back. That's good news. And, and, and the only one who knows that is God. And you know what? Sometimes you know, some Christians go, what do you mean Jesus didn't know? How could he was the Son of God? How could he not know these things? Well, the limitation of Jesus' knowledge right here affirms his humanity. See, I think we forget that Jesus, he voluntarily accepted human limitations, including this one. And he did this in submission to Father and his will. While Jesus was there on earth, uh, here on earth, uh, as the Son of God, he, he exercised his divine attributes only at the Father's direction. I believe the moment he ascended back to heaven, he, he was made aware of the time that he's going to return. Because he's God. I know it gets a little tricky and hard to figure that out. But in this moment, he did not know it just affirms his humanity. But what if Jesus had known in the moment about the actual time of the return? Would he have instructed his disciples differently? See, I think Jesus in his humanity instructs how we are to wait for his eventual return. Listen up, boys. Listen up, church. I'm not sure when I'm coming back, but I do know that I will be coming back, and I need you to be ready. Be on guard. Stay awake. He then likens it to a man going on a journey who puts servants in charge, each with their work. He commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Stay awake. Because you don't know what time the master of the house is going to come back. It happened in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or in the morning. The last thing you want it's for him to come home suddenly and, and, and find you asleep. Especially because you've all been given tasks to complete while you're waiting. Now Mark, he's writing this in a way that his Gentile audience would, would understand. See, the, the Romans, they used a, a four watch uh, for, for keeping time. Evening would have been 6 to 9 p.m. Midnight would have been, well, midnight watch would have been like from 9 p.m. till, till uh, midnight. When the rooster crows, that would be considered the third watch from midnight to 3 a.m., and then morning would be 3 a.m. to 6 a.m. Mark's just using that kind of language because it's what the Romans, or the Gentile readers would have understand, understood. Listen, church, Jesus is coming back. The world as we know it will end. And that truth right there should motivate us to stay awake and be at work for the master. We've been instructed to do just that. And I think about this, I've told this story before. When we lived in the Middle East, there was this village and it was kind of surrounded by 
all these rocks and mountainous kind of thing. And they had one little door into the city. And a little old guy, he was the doorkeeper, and that was his job to, 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 to keep watch over the door. So every day he would come up uh, out of bed and he would, would unlock the door. And then by the end of the day, he would go out and lock the door so that everybody was safe. That was his job. And, and then they blew a big hole open in this rock so that they could build a road through. There was no longer a, a, a gate into the city, but it just kind of made me laugh because this guy would still come out. It, it, the story goes that he would come out, and even though there's a wide open hole there, he'd still come out and he'd off lock and unlock the door every day. Because that was his job. That was all he was focused on was that, right? But, but he missed the fact that, that, that something had already passed him by. See, some of us, we're like that doorkeeper. We think, oh, we're busy. We're busy in the church. We're busy in the church. No, and we're missing. We're missing what we're actually supposed to be doing. Yeah, I know. We need people to sweep them up. And brothers that did that yesterday in the basement, thanks for doing that. It's important stuff. It's got to get done. But if your whole existence in the church is to sweep and mock, you're missing something. Next week, we're going to celebrate an amazing event that makes all this even possible. Christ's resurrection from the dead. We're going to look at Mark 16. We're going to fast forward next week. Church, I, I hope you're aware of this. Jesus went to the cross, obeying the will of the Father, in order that he might pay the penalty for the sin of the world. He, he died, he was buried, and he, what? He rose again on the third day. And then he, he did something kind of amazing. He spent the next 40 days kind of appearing to these apostles, those his remaining disciples of, and he, and he began speaking about the kingdom of God. He gives them and us instruction. He said, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be at work. What am I supposed to do? I'm going to give it to you. It's real simple. Acts 1. Look at it. Verses 6 through 8. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it's not for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my what? Witnesses. In Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Remember, at the very beginning of Mark chapter 13, one of the disciples said, is enamored with this magnificent temple. But here at the end of Mark 13, Jesus has to help him, really help all of us to have a proper focus with the challenge to stay awake. And be at work until the master returns. Make no mistake this morning, it's not about the building. It's about the bride of Christ doing what she's supposed to be doing. Like I said, there have been so many different viewpoints given on how it all is going to end. Listen, we know it's going to end. So you say, well, you're, you're trying to trivialize it. I'm really not. I'm just trying to help us stay focused on the things that we've been given to do while we wait. Listen, we're not going to ever allow this to be a country club church again. And some folks, when I first got here, were like, well, can we do this? Can we do that? And this and that. It was all about them. It's not about us. Often we make it about us. I mean, if you think about it, some of the end times theology out there, some of it's all about Israel, right? Some of it's all about the church. I'm saying we need to make it all about Christ. Because it's all about Him. Jesus is coming back. That you can be sure of. I want to challenge you this morning. Verse 37, what I say to you, I say to all, what? Stay awake. Even if the pastor's boring, stay awake. <laughs> Church, this should be our wake-up call this morning. 
Be at work making disciples. So I don't know how to make disciples. Do you have a Bible? The answer to that should be 100% yes because we give them away every Sunday. Nobody in this room should ever say, I don't have a Bible. Okay, number two, do you read your Bible? The answer to that should be 100% yes. Why? Because you're told to do it every week. I know how that works. I'm telling you something, friends. If you can begin to read your Bible and you study it and you take one thing, one thing, even if that's all it is, one thing, and you share it with somebody else, guess what you're beginning to do? You're helping someone else to become an authentic follower of Christ. Every one of us who claim to be authentic followers of Christ should at least be able to tell people, this is what Christ has done in my life. This is how I know I'm a Christ follower. And you should know some basic scripture to be able to point that to them. Be at work making disciples, teaching them to obey all that he has commanded. But the truth is, for some of us, you might need to start with yourself this morning. Yesterday, we were challenged as men, and I appreciate our brother Elder Steve uh, leading that. But yesterday, one of the things that he shared with us, and I think it's so important, confession and repentance are always an option. Like I said this morning, you may need to start with self. Confession and repentance are always an option. Some of us are always looking for the newest, you know, self-help thing. Some of us say, well, you know, they... He says the same thing every week. It's not rocket science. Following Christ doesn't have to be that hard. Now, denying self can be extremely hard. So this morning I want to challenge you. Be at work. And it may be that you need to start with self first. Church, Jesus is coming back. Let's be wide awake. I wish I could just help everyone have that passion and that fervor for, for sharing the hope of Christ. But I also am mindful where we live and, and, and all the things that are distracting us. I get caught up in that myself sometimes. So this morning, maybe there's just something that you're holding on to real tight that you need to just unpry your fingers from. I, I, I don't know, church. Maybe you still think you're on vacation. Got it all figured out. God saved me. I'm on vacation until he comes back. Well, I hope you've heard this morning. You're not on vacation until he comes back. Every one of us have a responsibility and a job to do. I hope we'll do it. If you've never turned to Christ, I would just encourage you this morning to consider the claims of Christ. I can, I'd encourage you to consider the prophecies fulfilled. Some people are still looking for signs. We don't need signs. We have Christ. Furthermore, we have his spirit living in us when we place our faith in him. Church, stay awake. Let's pray. Father, help us this morning to be awake. Help us to be at work. Help us to do what you call us to do. That's to make disciples, to, to help teach others to obey, to indicate that we need to obey as well. Help us to obey. 
Lord, forgive us for those times when we fail. Help us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.